Let's wait for it to kick in. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, so just to repeat myself, we are um, here tonight for the EYFS 2021 Implications for Provision and Practice in Communication, Language and Literacy. Um, really great to see you all. I'm Alison Jeffrey, Early Years Lead. Really pleased to be here with my colleague Jo. I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Jo Sawyer. I think I know quite a few of you. I'm Early Years Locality Officer um, for Mendip and South Somerset. So lovely to see you. Well, not see you all, but have you on board this evening. Thank you. Yeah, as, as always, we always say that, you know, it'd be lovely to be in face to face in person, but um, at least we're able to get all of this training out to you in readiness for September. So let's move forward. So, yeah, in the virtual world that we're living in at the moment, there's just a few things we just need to remember. Um, for the majority of the time, if we could please ask you to keep your cameras off for just to avoid any Internet issues. Um, similarly, keep yourselves muted because that does really save on the sound quality. Um, and there are going to be, uh, we've got about 70 plus booked on this evening, so there's going to be quite a lot of us. Uh, we have been using breakout rooms, but I don't think we're going to tonight. I think we're just going to let you all kind of put comments and, and have think have a think on, on your own and put comments in the chat. And obviously, we would love to hear from you if you're uh, brave enough to bring yourself off mute or even put your camera on. So, uh, so there will be lots of opportunities for interacting throughout the night. We are aiming to finish at um, uh, Harper State, just to let you know. So the session aims tonight, we're, we're packing quite a lot in, but as I said, we do give a lot of time for reflection. So we're going to concentrate. Alison, we can't see the presentation. Sorry. Ooh, I'm sorry. Apologies. Well, I can't. I don't know if everybody else can't. No, it cut out again. Sorry, everyone. There we go. You see it now? Yeah, thank you. Fabulous. Apologies about that, everyone. Yeah, so the session aims tonight, uh, becoming familiar with the educational programmes for communication, language and literacy and what this looks like in practice. Um, we're going to explore the role of the adult in supporting children's communication and language and an opportunity to kind of reflect what's going on in your settings at the moment or schools. Um, considering how to develop language rich environments then strategies to support language acquisition and vocabulary. Then we're going to look at um, some curricular aims and how to thread communication, language and literacy through them, as well as a little bit on assessment. So a couple of things hopefully for you to, to take away as well. Um, the presentation will be shared afterwards, so don't worry about writing loads of notes or anything. There are links throughout the presentation as well. So obviously with the presentation, you'll have all of that as well. OK, so just a little bit of background, really, to set the scene. Uh, we've all heard, you know, the kind of appalling statistics that are out there about the effect that a delay in speech and language can have on children's future life chances. And the early years really are that crucial time um, for us to be able to make a difference. Uh, and it's amazing. It just really blows my mind every time I say this. But 75 percent of a child's brain growth has occurred by the age of two uh, and by 22 months a child's development can predict outcomes at the age of 26. And then if you think as they go a little bit further on, not much further, but by the age of five, so in reception class, a child's vocabulary is a really strong predictor of their educational success and outcomes at the age of 30. So we really are in a position where we can make a massive difference to their lives and their livelihoods. Um, so, yeah, just just blows my mind, those statistics whenever I read them out. So we've got six sections tonight. Um, we're going to take it in turns, Joe and I. So I'm going to hand over to Joe for section one. Thank you. So, yeah, section one, we're going to think about becoming familiar with the educational programme for communication language and what this looks like in practice. Hopefully you have either read the um, educational programme for communication language or you're beginning to become familiar with them across all the areas of learning. But obviously tonight we're going to focus on communication and language. And the educational programmes are the must. So for some of you, some of this will be a recap, but we always say it's a little bit like the children. We need to repeat this all, our, all of this learning about what's coming in different contexts to embed it for us just as much as we would the children. So, so here we have the educational programme for communication and language. I'm just going to give you um, a, literally a few seconds just to scan through this rather than me rather dullingly reading it to you. And obviously the bold print are the key points. 
So if you just have a couple of seconds to a minute or so to read that one. OK, well, hopefully you've just got the gist of that, um, the educational programme there. Um, and the need here is to consider the educational programme and ensure that your curriculum reflects this and your provision promotes it. We're going to consider many elements of the programme throughout tonight's session, focusing on, like I said, the bold print there, those back and forth interactions, quality conversations, the environment, commenting on the reading, the stories, etc, the opportunities, conversation, storytelling, questioning, all of those things through tonight. So you need to be thinking about your long term curricular goal, for example, in communication and language and what you want for the children in your cohort when they leave. So obviously, if, if you're going to have a lot of new children coming your way in September, so it's really, really obviously some of them you won't know at the moment really what they want. Um, so but it's thinking about what you want for them when they leave and then going through your curriculum through that progression to support them. You know, what would you possibly pick out of the educational programme above that you would really want for those children in that cohort? You know, and this could be the yearly curriculum goal, aim, whatever you choose to call it. For example, it could be children enjoy sharing stories and talking about them. That would be a great aim, um, you know, and if any of you have started already thinking about this and putting something together and you've got some ideas, please share, pop them in the chat, like Alison said, um, or be brave enough to pop your hand up and have tell us because we'd love to hear if any of you have already started to think this. Now, a lot of this will already happen in your provision and in your what you've been doing the last year, the year before, etc. You will be thinking, OK, these children can do this. We want them to do the next thing and we're going to do this to get them there. But it's just the way now it has been put slightly differently in the new framework. So it's your opportunity now to review, to reflect on what you already do, keep what you do well and ensure these, these approaches and the educational programmes are embedded in your um, provision. There we go. So if we were thinking about the love of books, the, um, the curriculum one that I mentioned, the curriculum statement I mentioned just then, and obviously that is a key thread throughout the whole of the um, communication and language educational programme, we would want to make sure that we can engage them actively in stories, non-fiction, rhymes and poems. So Love My Books here is a fantastic resource um, just to link into. After the, you know tonight, you can go away and explore and it has lots of lovely ideas on there to support because consideration needs to be given to the range of stories, nonfiction, rhymes, poems that you will introduce to the children throughout preschool, nursery, as a childminder or in your reception class. And consideration also needs to be given to the progression in the stories, poems and rhymes so that children are introduced to new ideas over time. For example, you might on Love My Books, you would find top 10 poetry books, books in all ages, traditional tales. Apparently they're making a big comeback and they um, I'm going to discuss that a little bit later. They are really fantastic. Heroes and villains. Who doesn't love a story about them? Animals, dinosaurs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously linking to the children's in, um, interests as well. Um, you know, the introduction of traditional tales, the pro progression you may see there could start with a very simple sort of eight page board book with feely bits in. For example, I know um, there is an Usborne, um, the feely books they have, and I cannot remember the title of exactly of them, but there's a lovely one for the Three Little Pigs story where the child can just touch um, a feely section for bricks, straws and sticks. But then they would gradually progress to possibly a 20, 25 page storybook where there would be more complex vocabulary and detail. So you can see how that progression would occur. So ask yourself this question. Um, you know, if you want to answer it in the chat, that's fine. 
do you have an adequate range of books and that, that meet the needs of all the children in your cohort right now? And like it's, I've got on my notes here, I preemptive myself. This is something to take away tonight and discuss with your teams or reflect on if you are a childminder as well. You know, books need to be planned into your curriculum. I've got to put my hands up here. And as a manager of a nursery, you know, there would be the old time when it would be my turn for story. And I would walk towards that book area thinking, oh, my goodness gracious me, what am I going to read today? Oh, what should I pick? Oh, I'll just read that one. And that did happen. Now, that's not the right approach. You know, books need to be planned into what you are delivering and they can link into everything you do and they frequently will lead um, you know future learning and other activities. Books also need to be planned into home learning opportunities and you need to also here consider parents level of liter literacy and their exposure and experience of using books. You may wish to offer books um, on sort of a lending library service but also offer books with no pictures to encourage that communication and language between families and uh, but you must model and tell families that that's okay it's it's great to just look at a book and chat about what you see and this is great for non-fiction books as well particularly for boys as we all know apologies any gentlemen who have joined us this evening and encourage families to make up their own little stories and if they're really unsure you know offer youtube links to a, a a quality retail of a story so they can they can grasp that themselves believe it or not not everybody knows the hungry caterpillar off by heart like we all do um so definitely worth doing that and it will increase the parents confidence and the child can go home and share it and even tell their parent the story um you know it, and i think that's just such a lovely idea and also making up stories with your child as well I think that's lovely um, I frequently do that with my partner's grandson whatever we've done if he spends a day with me when I put him to bed at night we will have a story about what's happened in the day but it will be very very exaggerated with my imaginative mind with him as the starring role and then he'll bring in his own ideas and he'll just lie in bed and we'll talk no pictures but it's it's a really lovely activity so model that to parents as well oh no page so the education endowment foundation which i'm sure many of you are aware of their website gives information reports and lists of evidence-based interventions and various programs now i know we're talking about um, communication and language tonight but there's some fantastic stuff on there for early years math as well so please explore that when you hopefully will go on that website we really recommend that you look at the preparing for literacy document as you can see here this is an image of a poster that summarizes seven recommendations to support improving early language and literacy and they are very specific but with some great useful tips and you can actually go on and download the poster and print it off so that could be used in a staff room um, you know and used possibly as a reflective document to um, um, audit and evaluate your CLL provision um, you know, the guidance report offers early years professionals seven practical evidence based recommendations to provide every child, but particularly those from disadvantaged homes, which we know from all the other training and evidence that is out there. We really need to be need needing to think about these children with a high quality and well rounded grounding in early literacy, language and communication. So we're looking at prioritising the development of communication and language developing children's early reading using a balanced approach, develop children's capability and motivation to write, develop, sorry, embed opportunities to develop self-regulation, support parents to understand how to help their children learn, use high quality assessment to ensure all children make good progress, and use high quality targeted support to help struggling children. And as you can see, as I say lots of those things, I'm sure you're already thinking, well, I've that's in the seven key features of effective practice. That's in this document. That's in this document. So yet again, another key document you could use that complements many other um, items that you may be using to create your curriculum and to develop provision to support the children you have with you. Thank you, Alison. I'm going to hand back to you now. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, so section two. I'm going to start to explore the role of the adult in supporting children's communication and language and just an opportunity for you to reflect really on the effectiveness of the interactions in your settings or schools. 
So this is one of the four guiding principles. Um, the others being, and we're very familiar with them, aren't we? Every child is a unique child who's constantly learning. They can be resilient, capable, confident and self-assured. Children also learn to be strong and independent through positive relationships. Uh, and this one here, children learn and develop well in enabling environments with teaching and support from adults who respond to their individual interests and needs and help them to bring, build, sorry, their learning over time. Uh, and then it's also the importance of learning and development. As we know, children develop at different rates, uh, different times. Uh, the framework covers the education and care of all children in your early years provision. I just I wanted to put this one in and highlight it, really, because there's been some really subtle change in language. So um, although the majority of the four guiding principles are the same, they've subtly changed it to add in the uh, support from adults. And that really reflects the evidence, the research that says children cannot learn um, alone um, in independence completely. So although many of you are adopting in the moment planning, which is a great way of supporting children's learning, there's still elements of their learning that need some support from adults. We are the ones who are imparting information and supporting them to gain their knowledge. So without our sensitive interactions with children, we can't expect children to always make the next steps they need to make. So, in, for example, one really good example is maths, because maths is very quite fixed in the progression in what children have to learn to get to the next stage. It's that sticky learning. You've got to start with the basics and get it right. So the next stages of that learning happen uh, more easily. And without adults to support that and to put the right things into the environment, to ask the right questions in the right way at the right time, those children are at risk then of not having that learning. So I just wanted to highlight there for everybody that the support from adults is really, really key. So we're going to, um, over the next couple of slides, just obviously um, reflect on what that looks like. And it starts right the way from the, when a baby is at, at the earliest of ages. And this is called reciprocity. So it's reciprocal, a two-way street. So through ongoing back and forth exchanges of words and facial expressions, children communicate skills and their communication skills are strengthened as a result. And, you know, we've all been there, haven't we, with the youngest of babies? Yes, they can't, that they're nonverbal, they're not speaking words, but they're communicating with us through their eyes, through their gurgling, through their smiles, through, you know, moving their body. And we respond to that. You know, often it can look a bit daft when you, you know, um, blowing bubbles in a baby's face, for example, but that is communicating with them. It's really powerful. Uh, and that baby will be learning to communicate back because of that. And it does begin in infancy. Um, you know, a baby is already learning that communication is a two way street. Uh, and by eight months, a baby is on her way to complex reciprocal relationships with caregivers. So you can see again that it's this knowledge learning imparted over time that starts um, at the, with the youngest of babies. And it would be worthwhile just at this point, just to stop and reflect about this as well. So as early years providers, we want to be fair to all of our cohorts of children, don't we? We want to give them all undivided attention. We you know we all try our best to do that, but actually we need to think about not doing that. So it is common for us to share our time and attention equally amongst all the children we're working with, but we need to change that. Children who are not developing well as communicators need extra help and attention. They need the most highly skilled and trained staff to support them. So in no way am I suggesting that we're going to ignore some children, but some children will be able to access our curriculum easier than others. They will be able to take their next steps. And of course, we need to interact with them at times, but there will be others that are struggling and we need to give them additional support to develop their communication. So it's just worth kind of taking, um, you know, step back, um, just scanning over a room just to see what's happening in terms of communication and wondering, is this the case? Are we really putting the time and attention into those children who really, really need it when they need it? 
And this also uh, feeds into the gender gap as well. So um, it seems that from an early age, many girls are encouraged to be closer to adults necessarily than boys, to talk with them, play a part in collaborative activities. Um, and it seems that boys are encouraged to get on thing with the things on themselves in a more independent way. And that is a very sweeping statement. It might not be your experience. However, this research has been done and it is suggesting that the way children communicate is very different sometimes uh, compared between boys and girls. So as practitioners, we have to work really hard to encourage boys to communicate as they play. This means encouraging them to feel confident and take, play, take part in all the activities that we have on offer. Um, and, it, you know, socialisation, you know, is quite different sometimes for girls. Um, they're encouraged more to be around adults and we'll often kind of, again, scan around a room and there'll be a flock of girls around an adult. And the boys are just getting on with their play, maybe block play, maybe playing outside, etc. So it's being sensitive and making sure that we give those boys the same opportunity to communicate with us, to use their wide range of vocabulary and to um, build on that over time. And this is from a Nursery World um, article, actually. So um, we've got the link in here. It'd be useful, um, helpful, I think, for, for you know to look at that one if you have the time. And then we move on to uh, Kathy Brody. So you know we could have made up our own kind of um, quality conversations and parts of it, but Kathy Brody does it so so well. So please do research her if, again if you have some time. Um, and she's put together her seven ways to develop high quality adult child interactions in your early years setting. And the first one. Um, it, you know, should be really obvious. It's about paying attention and being in the moment. We're not necessarily talking about being in the moment in terms of the planning, but it's being in the moment so that that child really knows that we're there with them. And it can be really difficult in a busy setting, can't it? You know, it's full on looking after children. And, you know, sometimes you've got many children in your care. However, being in the moment and trying as much as possible to put our own distractions out of our minds will mean you're much more likely to notice when children Children use new words when they explain their thinking and explore new ideas. If we're thinking about, oh gosh, I need to get ready for snack time or I've got to go and do the baby's nappies in a minute, rather than really listening and being in the moment with that child, you know, we may miss things. So it's just trying when you can, I know it's busy, but to just really, really concentrate on those moments. This is also an ideal situation for sustained shared thinking as well. So again, it's where you support a child to uh, develop concepts and extend them to problem solve or think about previous ideas and build on them. And that, that involves that reciprocity, that two way communication. So again, it's having the time to really focus in on what that child's saying and support them sensitively to explore and extend their ideas and thinking, which will really support their learning. Uh, number two is about time to think. Uh, and it is very tempting to have every single minute of your day filled. You know, we're all working in busy settings or in busy classrooms um, and wanting to occupy the children all the time. But I think it's also really important, and, and I'm sure Joe will build on this in a bit with a language rich environment element of this, but to have those opportunities for quiet time as well. Um, that helps them just to reflect on what's been going on. They might just be looking themselves at what's happening around them, having a moment of kind of time out. Um, and that is actually allowing them to assimilate their knowledge and listen carefully to the language around them. So a really, really important element of this. It could be that you have a quiet den or a withdrawal area or just a little kind of cosy nook in the corner of your setting. But those cosy nooks are really important for those moments. Also interesting as well, this made me think about something that Julie Fisher said in our conference, um, and it's amazing. I, I know Jo gave you a time to read through the educational programme just before, but what she says is sometimes children need up to 30 seconds to respond to a question they're asked. Uh, and for us as adults, you know, that feels quite uncomfortable sometimes, doesn't it? Just to sit in silence with a child when you've asked a question and then you have to wait. But actually, that's so important. They desperately want to be able to give us an answer to the questions we're asking. We just need to give them that time to really think about it and be able to respond. Number three is about modelling language and we all do that really really well. We see it time and time again in settings and our um, area Senko team tell us that you all do this really really well uh, but just worth kind of reminding yourself. So instead of asking direct questions um, it's about using open-ended questions and using different ways to interact with the children. So it's using that running commentary that we all know about. So playing alongside children, not questioning them but just commenting on what they're doing, adding some language in um, so that 
that child is really understanding what it is they're doing and therefore would be able to articulate themselves over time. And also questioning yourself. We're going to sound a bit mad as early as practitioners, but actually, I wonder how many cups they need. I know I'll, ca I'll count everyone here. You know, it demonstrates to the child that actually you're talking to yourself, but you're actually engaging with what they're doing. Um, and, and it again moves their thinking forward. Number four is about showing your interest. Uh, and this is really important, isn't it? All children really desperately want to tell us things occasionally. And sometimes we're rushed and we don't really have the time to listen. But it's important that we do. There can be a pressure, you know, to, to want to record every interaction. But sometimes the best interactions are those that, you know, and they do leave a lasting impression on a child are the ones that happen in the spur of the moment as well. So really being interested around tidying up time or um, children will know that you're really interested in what they have to say if you're actually looking them in the eye and getting down to their level and doing all the things that we know what we need to do and that will show that you value them and those interactions and they'll want to do that more. Working with home again you know this is an obvious one really isn't it we all know how vital parent partnerships are um, but especially with regards to children's language as well so for example, the number of different words children hear at home and the complexity of the language. Apologies about the noise in the background. It's my husband's phone going off. <laughs> but it will greatly, greatly affect children's own language development. Collaborating with parents and encouraging them to talk with their children at home, giving them every opportunity from walking to the setting and having a discussion with their child to discuss, discussing, you know, the shopping or reading books at bedtime together can really improve the interactions that they have um, at home and will support the learning um, as well. Number six is having fun. Again, quality interactions are far more likely to occur if there's a culture in your setting to really enjoy what you're doing and have a laugh with the children. You know, those moments that are really hysterical, you know, really do laugh and have fun with those children. They will love it. If you laugh with them at a silly joke they've done or you put a silly word into one of your favourite nursery rhymes, um, you know, that kind of thing, that playful use of language will really support children to want to do that as well and encourage their learning as a result. And then lastly, it's those shared experiences. And we've been referring to lots of uh, this at the, at, during our training. It's about rich first hand experiences. Um, and sometimes the best quality interactions are those that actually don't involve any language at all. So it might be that a bee flies in the window and comes into the setting. You know, that moment to talk about that and to discuss that is sometimes one of the best experiences from an interaction perspective that that child, um, you know, will enjoy that day. And it's important knowing that someone else is interested in what they're looking at as well. So if you're looking at a worm, you know, um, wriggling across the pathway, you don't even have to say anything about it. Just by looking at that child or kind of raising your eyes or looking in wonder will know that they're with you and you're sharing that experience with them, which is really powerful. OK, so a bit of time for you to uh, reflect yourselves now. And as I said, we're not going to put you into breakout rooms tonight. So please do use the chat uh, and interact. Uh, and if you would like to put your hand up and obviously um, speak, then you're very, very welcome. But it, thinking about those seven um, uh, Kathy Brodie's, you know, those features of effective um, interactions with children. Is there anything that you might think about doing differently? Or on the other hand, are there some really great things that you're doing that have a really great effect on children? We'd love to know. Um, and everybody, you know, has um, the benefit of sharing um, your knowledge and, and, um, and things that have happened in your setting. So please do use your chat, start putting things in there. Or if you'd like to put your hand up and get involved, we'd love to hear from you. So we had some the other day, for example, around um, activities like the mud kitchen uh, and the kind of interactions that go on there and the, the practitioner being there and, and talking about kind of cooking things that the child probably hadn't had experience of and just commenting and adding to um, and say, well, should we add the garlic in and things like that? So it's having those interactions that extend the child's thinking in terms of use the mud kitchen, for example. But other things that you do would be um, be really great to hear about them.
everyone's been quiet. I think one thing Alice and I can remember doing is actually giving link to what Kathy Brody says about learning at home and parents is giving parents the confidence to realise that they are helping their children by as they walk to nursery chatting to them and just having that like that two way interaction and make it you know they may not view it as what people may have seen teaching and experience but they are doing really good things encouraging them to put their phones away and actually talk with their children very simple you know and talk through just what we would call boring daily activities you know children when they're little they love to help with putting the washing in the washing machine and and you think of all those different words you can introduce them to etc through day-to-day -day routines it doesn't have to be oh let's get the paints out let's do this it can just be you know when you're doing your housework so it's encouraging you know parents to realise whatever they're doing and encouraging them to communicate and have the confidence to do it as well I think. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think you're right I think parents sometimes think that it's it's complicated you know they're thinking about yeah. school maybe secondary school kind of stuff oh do I need to teach them this and it's not it's literally just talking mm -hmm. to your child very normally isn't it and trying yeah. to encourage them to do less of this with their phones. Yeah. 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 Okay let's move on. So I love this one. It's only when practitioners wait, watch and wonder are they likely to make good decisions about whether their intervention will help or hinder the learning taking place. And again, this is taken from Julie Fisher. We absolutely loved what she did and, and what she said made so much sense in our conference. And this is about being attentive and sensitive um, and asking yourself questions rather than bombarding the children with them. And actually, from my perspective, I felt that this could help with that 30 second wait. So actually, in your mind, you're thinking, I wonder why they're pursuing this idea. You're not saying it out loud. I wonder whether this play arose from explorations yesterday. But it's just allowing that space. It's giving you time to reflect and think and wonder what's going on. Um, and, you know, if they're getting frustrated, maybe you're picking up on little cues and things like that. So, um, so yeah, it is definitely about being um, sensitive with the kind of interactions you're having. So, um, yeah, take the time to talk to yourselves first and, and then you're less likely to talk too much as well. Sometimes we pepper children with things because, they, you know, it's that quiet moment. But actually, you know, even asking what you are doing means a child has to stop what they're doing in order to answer your question. So using some of these um, different techniques will support children to carry on, but be supported um, at the same time. We have got some lovely examples that have just come through, Alison, oh, in response okay. to the Cathy Brody bits. I don't know. Mandy Trout says we had rhubarb out, the children cut it up and used pebbles for the crumble top. A four year old then instigated a conversation with an adult and her peers about what would be good to go with it. Oh, Amazing. that's lovely. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Love a bit of rhubarb as well. Yeah, yeah I was going to say <laughs> I gave some custard with that one. <laughs> Um, what talk to children about their home from Natalie, what they did at the weekend. Do you help mummy explain what we are doing and why? And Ryan said, um, we encourage our EAL parents to continue speaking home language and over time their child will pick up English. Most parents worry and think they should use English, which doesn't come naturally to them. Yeah, definitely. Some really lovely ideas. Yeah, it's, it's nice to talk about um, EAL children as well, because a lot of this is absolutely spot on for them as well, or for all children. But yeah, absolutely great, Ryan. Thank you. So thinking about questioning now, and this did come up in the educational programme, you know, one of the bits that was highlighted and Joe pointed out. Um, and it's worthwhile just thinking about the kinds of questions you use. And this could be something that you do uh, like as an activity with uh, a peer to peer observation with your colleagues or for childminders to talk about this with your childminding networks. But the different types of questions here, we've used the example of Winnie the Pooh just to make it, um, you know, to make the examples more obvious. But those evidence based questions. So how do you know Winnie the Pooh got stuck in the rabbit hole? And then you're exploring the reason and the theory. Why did Winnie the Pooh get stuck in the rabbit hole? Then you've got your counterfactual suggestions. What would have happened if Winnie the Pooh had not eaten the honey? You can see that these open ended different types of questioning just opens up possibilities for other answers other than those quote closed questions, which is really going to limit the children's responses. And then you have your false belief. What does Winnie the Pooh think has happened to stop him getting out? And then your future hypothetical suggestion. 
what could Winnie the Pooh do next? And it sounds complicated, the names of these types, types of questions, but you can see and reflect on the questions we use every day and the different types of questions we use. So supporting other colleagues to use these as well uh, just might be uh, you know, a worthwhile exercise to do and to audit maybe. And lastly, from this section, it's um, just useful to put in here about some of the best quality interactions actually being between children themselves and not involving an adult whatsoever, but the adult being on hand to listen and to notice uh, and, you know, if necessary to to write an observation. But obviously we're trying to move back from that. So don't underestimate the importance of those um, peer interactions, you know, especially for those shy or reluctant children as well, because they will often speak to their peers much easier than they do speaking to an adult. So being there to kind of just notice that and to listen will give you a lot of information about what language that child has um, and, you know, their, their interests, which you can then obviously use to try and help them to to open up a bit more. So encouraging children to collaborate together. So, you know, we think about projects being a school thing, but actually you can have really simple projects that children can work at, work on together in, in um, you know, nurseries and preschools uh, and in childminder uh, uh, settings as well. So collaborating together on that um, rather than, you know, taking over, it might well lead to unexpected and interesting solutions that you haven't thought through. So just letting them kind of solve those problems together. Also allowing children the opportunities to appreciate those different styles of speech as well. So, for example, when they talk to an adult, they might sp speak differently than when they speak to a friend or when they speak to a baby. That's a very obvious one, isn't it? Um, and actually, that was part of the early learning goal um, in previous EYFS uh, profile was, um, you know, teachers actually had to um, talk about whether children could do that because it's a skill that they learn over time. And just one uh, question, a bit of food for thought, really, to take away with you. But it'd be interesting just to see how many ob observations you have of children talking amongst themselves or whether they're more dominated by you talking to them and getting a response, because it might be quite interesting if you don't have many uh, to, to, you know, to trial that out for a bit and see what evidence you might get. And again, remember, noticing doesn't necessarily mean writing down. OK, thanks. I'm going to hand back over to Jo. Thank you, Alison. So we're moving on now to section three. We're going to look at part that part of the educational programme for communication language, which talks about um, that they should they should have those quality conversations with adults in a language rich environment. So we're now going to look at what we provide for the children. And again, this may well be a recap for some of you, because I know I've visited many settings and childminders and I'm astounded at the amazing ideas that are out there and I often jot them down to suggest to somebody else and store up here for um, future support but you know let's um let's really think about it um, and see what else we can come up with to offer those high quality language experiences so again we're going to ask for your thoughts here so please be brave we, we don't bite if you would like to um, come off of mute or put pop something in the chat what can early year settings do to provide a language rich environment? So have a real think about and here you could just put down anything that you have, particularly in your provision that works well and encourages this. You know, what is it you have done? Is it is it a certain area you've created or is it the actual physical resources the children can access? And you hear children communicating and using language they've never used before or something you do with the children. So if any of you would love to, we'd love for some of you to come forward and give a couple of examples. Give you a, a minute or so to obviously think and give you time to type if you'd rather not come off, to, off mic. It was often those quiet moments again, wasn't it, where where actually it, it promotes language. Sometimes if you've got yeah. the uh, music on in the background, if, if for a minute you turn it off and then just be yeah. quiet, sometimes yeah. that will um, yeah, create opportunities as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not always about the objects, is it? It's about literally the, <laughs> yeah, like you just said, that, that what they can hear as well can be distracting. I'm going to talk a little bit about it in a minute, the lighting, things like that can even have an impact. Oh, that sounds lovely. We have put a fairy garden in our outside area. Well, that's just great, isn't it? Because that would definitely spark. That's Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, I don't know how to say your name. Um, 
but that would definitely spark lots of um you know language and ex excitement as well they would want to talk about it and ask those questions and like Alison said you as the adult could model those well how, what's this how did this get here etc um yeah and then you just add those little provocations when they're not there overnight don't you and it, it just sparks them off again Tessa said we have story and rhyme props each day in the book corner, an extensive range of story sacks which parents can borrow. Fantastic. We have books on the tables, e.g. on a number game table, we'll put a number book, dinos on the floor with dino books. That's fantastic. Yeah. So children don't just see books as a standalone event book but reading at the end, you know, story time at the end of the day, which we all tend to do, which is absolutely fine. But it, it's woven in. It's a natural um, item to have within your day-to-day -day provision that's really lovely and I like the um, story sacks and parents borrowing them lovely to support that extended learning in the home oh it's all coming in now we have life um oh Sue's a very oh it's just gone down it's old mobile talking, phones so you... <laughs> yeah old mobile phones brilliant pair of phones connected by a long tube brilliant love it lovely yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's role play, isn't it? That's a great way to encourage it. And we're going to talk about that as well. Um, oh, I just see somebody has just put, we have purchased the You Choose book. So I'm very excited to explore them. Yeah, I agree, Philippa. I think they're more exciting for the adults. And that's something you can just sit with a few children and really have fun with. Um, what else have we missed? Not give yeah, children all the answers. Mandy says, an example of this, we have a solar water fountain and the children chat along to each other whilst they play as we pose questions to help them work it out why, how and why it works. Exactly. Yes. Let, Gemma let said about observe. life cycle as well, watching caterpillars change to butterflies and mm. still have tadpoles and froglets. Froglets, oh. I love that word. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, Georgia has said we have topics and each week there are different adult led activities. We embed language into our discussions and environment and then consolidate this through adult led activities. We also have a friendship bench where children can go if they are feeling sad. The children notice peers sat there and help them to comfort them using lots of quality language. That's absolutely lovely. Oh, that makes me feel all warm and lovely inside. Yeah, and it's nice to see them using language, um, you know, to support each other as well and to help somebody. Um, it's not always obviously they're learning through that, but it's not always about factual information about something. That's lovely. We have an apple tree in the garden. So we ask about the size of apples, what we can make with the apples, apple crumble, apple pie. There's a bit of a theme tonight. We've had rhubarb crumble. Now we've got apple crumble. This is making me Ooh. hungry. <laughs> <laughs> This is lovely ideas. Thank you so much, everybody. A real range there. You know, we're talking about. Oh, you know, just letting children lead what they're doing, encouraging, you know, in role play support including families at home lovely really great thank you very much for those ideas and you know I'm, I'm sure there'll be people here jotting some of those down and borrowing them to use in their settings which is what it's all about so how can you provide a language rich curriculum and again probably you are already doing an awful lot of these but with all of these changes coming along it's these opportunities now isn't it to to reflect and sort of almost audit reflect on what you are doing so we'll just briefly talk about these here you need to have those close relationships and we're talking about this from day one between you and the children you and the, the, your you and the parents the family possibly extended families grandparents um, between staff as well if children feel happy and confident and uh, at ease within the relationships then they will obviously feel happy and relaxed to talk as well and and if they can see that you know that two-way interaction occurring between you and the parents and you and you and other members of staff as well then um, you know it's really important and they will have that being modeled to them introducing vocabulary at every single opportunity you know, this is something with the EYFS reforms that I think is is definitely going to be something that is going to be enabled possibly more. I know we all do it already, but definitely more. I've actually spoken to somebody who is an early adopter 
uh, a supervisor at, at a preschool and she has said that one of the key things that has happened in the last year has been the opportunities for her and her staff to as she puts it be in inverted commas with the children and tune in to what they're saying and introduce key you know different words or just a few words that can extend their knowledge extend their learning and also obviously introducing new things to them and that's been amazing she said that's one of the biggest things that has been an advantage for her because you know she said if we, we had our heads in an iPad or writing up an observation on our clipboards or something or we would not we would have missed all of these lovely little bits that we are finding out about the children so yeah and introducing vocabulary at every opportunity one thing she did say though and I hope Alison would agree with me here uh, at every opportunity I think Alison said it just now we sometimes need to be careful that we don't almost overstimulate and like think all oh, right well one of, one of the goals is we've got to talk to them all the time and give them all these new words it's about letting them have time to absorb them as well and possibly use them in a different context in the setting or you know you talk to the parent about it and they can use them at home so think about that giving time to talk as well um Alison's already talked about the 30 second response um thing and it's hard 30 seconds is a long time like she said but again that links to that early adopters experience you know having that time to be with the children and talk to them them about their experiences at the weekends or just um she said to me that one of the loveliest things was just being able to possibly sit with the children when they were having a snack and have that normal two-way interaction just a chat that's all it is but it's you can imagine how how much key um learning was happening then having a range of resources to support children's role play and acting out ideas you know the role play um has already had been highlighted with sue Thank you, Sue, um, giving us that thought about mobile phones and telephone. Everybody, every child witnesses a member of their family on a phone making a call, um, you know, all of these things. So having those resources and often the real things are better than, you know, a, a, what you would call a plastic, a plastic phone, um, you know, and it encourages them to, you know, have those two way conversations as well even though sometimes you do hear the odd strange thing that they say to someone on a phone that they've heard their parents say. <laughs> Encourage children's imaginative and storytelling skills by, you know, scribe that story for them. I'm sure many of you have heard of helicopter stories where, you know, that's obviously the practitioner hovering around what the children are playing or what they're talking about and then having um you know possibly a large sheet of paper and you scribe the story the child may draw an image or make marks that are their words and you can write as well and create those stories whatever they are all about like i said stories with no books are a fantastic way particularly if that the, the child is the, is the starring role as well um, I can remember, re you know, I used to just sometimes randomly just start telling a story rather than reading a book. And I would start by saying, um, you know, one day there were two boys in the nursery playground and you could see the boys literally itching for me to say their names. And when I, you know, when I did, if I did pick two of them, they looked at each other and, and everybody else as if say, yes, it's me today. I'm the starring role. And But it used to spark so much off. And then sometimes they would role play those stories as well. So definitely, um, you know, storytelling skills and scribing is a fantastic opportunity. Following children's interests, we all know this one. Um, it's like anything, you know, if we're watching TV and we don't like something, we turn it over. You know, if, if the children don't like something that we're offering to them, you know, they're going to not obviously use a remote and turn us off or put us on mute. They might like to sometimes, but they're going to, you know, switch themselves off from that moment and be thinking about something else. Um, there is, I've got a, if anybody would like it, please let me please let me know and I can send it to you. I've got a lovely poster of a child sort of poopy down in, in a sand pit. Um, it's an artist's image and the quote on the side says something along the, along the side is, why did you take me away from the sand pit to count plastic objects at a table when I was pouring, exploring, and, you know, talking about how they were exploring capacity and building and problem solving? Um, yep, I'll send it, I'll, I'll get it 
Gemma to send it with the PDF of this this document of this presentation. Sorry. Yeah. So it's really thinking about following their interests and trying to weave into if you have a curricular goal, you know, you have a statement that is part of your progression for learning. You know, can you weave that into what the children are interested in rather than taking them away? And I know that lots of you do that already and you're probably saying, well, we do this. Fantastic. Continue to do it. Continue to do it and create exciting provocations with open ended resources that children want to look at, touch, feel and explore. You know, I, I visited a setting. Oh, this was probably a good two and a half years ago. Um, and I can remember the ladies there telling me that they had some teapots, a selection of all sorts of different ones, you know, stainless steel, um, really pretty china ones, you know, sort of a, a one. They had a really large sort of catering teapot there. And I was like quite fascinated. I said, what's all this teapot stuff? What's going on? The children were playing with them in the water and taking them to the role play. And apparently when um, one of the members of staff commented to another something about, oh, yeah, we had a cup of tea and we made it in the teapot and it made such a difference. A child overheard this and said, what's a teapot? So it's interesting. That child obviously had never seen one, um, you know, and, and I don't know, not all of us have teapots in our homes, do we? So they decided to bring in some teapots and they just it was a, quite a small setting and they put them on the snack table in the middle when the children were having snacks and just sat with them and sparked off all this conversation about what a teapot is that then led to them to visit a local cafe um, to experience a, a cup of tea etc um, and then they played with them in the role play and so on and so on and so on so you can see how that exciting provocation from actually the children did lead to that exploration and all that different vocabulary and all those different experiences. Um, and I'm sure that your children appear some mornings, some afternoons, days with random objects or they've had an experience and an object or just a photograph can be a provocation to support, um, you know, moving forward and, and encouraging children like this little one here in the picture to really want to explore, touch and feel. So again, here we have the Education Endowment um, Foundation. We cannot, um, you know, advocate them enough, really. Um, you know, through your curriculum, following on from your thoughts about a language rich environment, we, through your curriculum, you need to include all the opportunities that are here on the slide. And this very much complements what is within the educational programme. You know, communication and language approaches used in the early years include reading aloud to children, discussing books and explicitly extending children's spoken vocabulary by introducing them to new words in context. So then they grasp that understanding, draw attention to letters and sounds. They can also include approaches more directly aimed at developing thinking and understanding through language, such as sustained shared thinking, which Alison has touched on, all that guided interaction, us there as the guide through their learning. Um, so, yeah, like I said, we cannot encourage you enough to look at the the, um, the Preparing for Literacy Education Endowment Foundation document to support with um, how to encourage this even further. So continuing the um, development of language rich, high quality environments, here's some we're going to look at book corners, now book areas, book corners, whatever you like to call them. Um, everybody does have different names. Um, you know, the book area is an area that every room should have or every child mind is home. And this area, it should you should have this regardless of the age or stage of children you work with. An outstanding book area will go above and beyond holding the basic books and will probably display a wide variety of resources that can intrigue and support any learning and development. Um, and it's really important to have this dedicated area, however small it is, because I appreciate, you know, some of these you can see in the pictures are quite large. Um, if you're a child minder or even a pack away setting, you might not have the space to have these or the, you know, the features of that within are uh, within them. So it's about being creative and there are so many ideas out there. An exciting book corner is part of the basic early years provisions we know that and should encourage both adults and children to use it frequently as well 
practitioners need to spend time planning and maintaining the areas just like we said about planning books into your story time and into your daily provision and books need to be tidied and changed regularly you know there's nothing worse than a you know a tatty bookshelf um and we appreciate as your children explore it you know it's about how it might get a little bit untidy but it's about being with the children to understand how they look after books and respect books as well because sadly as we know some children don't have access to many books within their home environments they might not have had that actually modeled to them how to hold a book and turn pages and I'm sure we can all think of moments when we have seen a child you know start from the back of a book and upside down so it's really important that we do that as in our role of the adult and do you audit your book area do you you know think to yourself okay yeah have I got enough books sort of non-fiction books for example have I got enough traditional tale books um story books in in that set in my area it is said that the best way to strengthen children's intelligence is actually to read them fairy tales. Some may not agree with that. You know, um, think of all the, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk is a great one, isn't it? Three Billy Goats Gruff. Yes, there's all of there is an element of fear in some of these stories, but it's about talking to the children about these. There's so many opportunities. I think I must have. You know, a, a traditional fairy tale could last can last for weeks as sort of an overarching theme to support children's development in many areas of learning. The book corner should also be in the quietest part of the room and try to include like sort of like a small nook somewhere quiet that children, if they want that solitary space, we all like time to ourselves sometimes, don't we? Just to be quiet and on our own. And if possible, it should be protected by three sides, by walls, shelves or room dividing panels. You know, be creative. In the photos here, you can see some of the items here may cost a little bit more money, but it's about, Nikki always calls it that beg, borrow and barter system. You know, if you put an appeal out to parents, you know, have you got X, Y, Z? Have any of you got an, a, a small, you know, sofa uh, or some bean bags or something? Um, you know, I'm sure you would you would receive some contributions. Um I, I, one idea I have I have recently seen it was on a social media post is that a, um, a teacher it was in a reception class was really struggling to get her children to enter the um, you know to use her book area so she she her theme um, was actually under the sea and what she did was she actually put a paddling pool um, I hasten to add with no water in the book area quite a large one um, with books and props and things and under the sea non-fiction books in the paddling pool and she said she just couldn't get the children out of there then she was struggling to get them out rather than get them to go in just because of the novelty of actually climbing into a paddling pool in your clothes but then when they got in there they were distract they got distracted by the books and then settled and were looking and exploring so I just thought that was a lovely idea and a paddling pool could be quite a nice idea for um you know a pack away setting because you can deflate it quickly and stick it away in a box just a another simple but but fun idea as well so moving on obviously like I said some of the images in the previous page um you know there are items in there like the wicker arch that would cost a little bit more money but you can create those simple yet effective book areas as you can see here we've in many settings um and provisions have the the traditional tough spot in them now and as you can see in the top central picture there um a sheet has been put over it to create that that nook and that den and that doesn't wouldn't have to be a permanent feat feature that could just be something that you created literally in the morning for the children for one or two days and see how they responded to it and the, all of these things here there's a little sofa you know the simple cushions and a blanket outside it's offering these book areas to entice the children into it you know the story stones all these really really simple ideas I don't know if any of you have heard of mini me's. Um, it sounds like a nice lolly, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> mini me's are photographs laminated of of characters from a storybook, or the children will love it if you make mini me's of them, and also mini me's of you. Slightly embarrassing when they start to prance you around on a stick and tell a story about you, but really, really lovely fun. And then they can bring themselves into storytelling. Um, and also, I know lots of you are thinking about producing possibly learning journeys with your children um, of all about which will obviously be all about them. And there's lots of 
um, conversation at the moment about floor books, aren't there? About which are basically a story, a recall of what's happened in the setting, possibly around a topic, a theme, an activity. So those are great opportunities to um, have in, in your book area for children just to pick up and look at. And you can imagine if they picked up a scrapbook of, um, you know, I, I'm trying to think of something now, possibly building dens to um, houses outside to keep away the big bad wolf. And there was photographs of them. That The, the vocabulary the, and that two-way interaction would be fantastic between the children. Story sacks have been mentioned. And if you want to create them, you know, make them with the children. Um, you know, if you have a setting, a larger setting, you could you could have that as an activity to look for the resources that would help make a story sack around a particular area. So it's just being really, really creative. And there's so much available online to support. If any of you have any really good links for any websites or anything, please share. We would love to know about them. And I'm sure your colleagues would as well. So we need to think about, obviously, those ideas to enhance your outdoor space and promote that imagination and talk. And we've got some images out, out here of sort of outdoor activities on a slightly larger scale. We've got some role play things here. You know, we've got the children making the den. We've got the train here with the boxes. Um, you know, if you had that train out, the children could personalise them by decorating them um, individually. Um, you could, there's so many ideas. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? What's it going to be like when they get there? Do we need to wear any certain clothes? You know, or, and this would just, they would just leave that whole activity, wouldn't they? Um, you know, because when children do not have much language, trying to talk with them can be very, very hard and quite tiring for ourselves. So role play and engaging in that, particularly outside, is one of those um, opportunities where children will naturally use language with each other. And where children are not engaged in this type of play, we need to consider how we help them to join in. You, we all know that if you sit, if you just walk over to a home corner and there's a couple of children in there, even if you don't say a word, they will eventually pass you a cup of tea or a plate of very random, strange looking food and expect you to just instinctively join in with them. And then there is your cue. There is your opportunity to begin to use those words. Oh, thank you for that. That, that was absolutely delicious. You know, so you're immediately in or you could say, I really don't like the taste of that. It was very sour. Um, you know, so immediately through their play, something they've initiated, you're introducing those new words to them. And there's, you know, it's just thinking with your commentary with their role play about joining in with them, making sure that you give those opportunities. So here are some ideas to enhance talk in your outdoor areas. And I'm sure looking at this list, many, many, many of you have lots and lots of these. Um, I'm just going to stop there because I would like to read a couple of the things that have come in. Um, Tessa has said our books in the book area are changed daily in line with our colour coding system, which rotates the resources in charging or oh, ensuring all areas of learning are covered daily. That's fantastic. And Natalie said in our nursery, we have a massive train that's been there for 15 years. And when the children sit on it, we ask questions about who is driving, where are we going? Can we have ice cream, etc. Sounds like a lovely resource. Very nice. And, and you know, gives so many opportunities for that conversation to develop and that vocabulary. Great. So, yeah, back to the ideas outside. And like I said, I'm sure many of you have these. Um, and some of them you might be thinking over the last 18 months. Well, no, we haven't had them because obviously COVID restrictions have been in place. Um, but as we possibly return, fingers crossed, to some form of normality, hopefully these are your opportunities as you reintroduce some of these areas that you may not have had. Um, you you begin to evaluate and and really think to yourself do these things offer rich language opportunities do they offer opportunities for talk to happen do i engage with them in these areas to promote that talk um you know thinking about auditing these these areas i'm not going to read them all out individually because you can see them on the list there 
um, you know, if you would like to um, audit your environment, which includes the outside and includes a section on the characteristics of effective teaching and learning, we have a learning environment audit on our EYFS reforms page. And I know Nikki the other day when she was delivering this training, she mentioned that she can access a book corner audit as well. So if you are interested in that, please get in touch and um, I will nudge Nikki to organise that and we will make that available as well. So yeah, just some ideas there to make sure it's not just about offering these areas, it's about making sure how we encourage children to engage and how our um, how our vocabulary and interactions encourage that engagement and enhance the talk. So communication friendly environment. Now, lots of you have probably heard of the term communicating friendly spaces as well. And these are spaces that encourage and promote good communication. And the approach focuses on the role of the environment in supporting speaking, listening skills, emotional well-being, physical development and general engagement. So everything basically in that statement there, it supports the, you know, a communication friendly environment will support all of these things. The environment in which a child learns can be an important factor in supporting their CNL development. So take it right back. Imagine if you had a blank classroom. You know, what elements should you consider to develop a communication friendly and inspirational place? If any of you would like to pop any thoughts into um, into the chat, that's fine. But I think we've talked about an awful lot of them there. And I have talked, we did comment earlier about that it's not always just about the physical items that the children can play with, but it's about, um, you know, possibly having that quiet area, the distraction from, you know, if you're near, a, if your setting is near a busy road or, you know, your um, setting comes off a busy corridor in a school setting, for example, um, you know, make sure the book corner is not near the doorway. And think about lighting as well. Um, and that can really affect children, as in make them almost a little bit too sparky or or it can distract them or make them feel sort of like tired. Um, I know my daughter who is at university studying, there are certain areas, um, not so much now because she's not allowed to go there, but there were um, <laughs> certain areas in the library where, there's, you know, it was that horrible strip lighting and she just could not concentrate when she was in there. So, um, you know, have a little think about that. And Alistair Bryce Clegg, we all know and love him dearly. Um, he has written an article actually about the impact of different types of light on children and how we need to encourage as much natural light into the settings to help them with, you know, within with with the to be in a good environment. And obviously I'm talking about the light. So they're settled and happy. But then if they're settled and happy in their learning, they will then communicate confidently and freely as well. We don't want them to be upset by that. All of those, um, you know, distracting things. And it's thinking about do you have neutral colours, um, you know, an interesting objects as well for them to explore and, I, and we've had lots of lovely ideas already come through um, and you know it would be something really interesting for you to go back and sort of look around and think does my environment promote that communication friendly opportunity thank you Alison I'm going to hand back to Alison for section four Thanks, Joe. Yeah, so we're going to look at strategies now to support language acquisition and vocabulary. Uh, you know, clearly all of these sections that they have overlaps. There's, you know, there's things that really are a golden thread through through every kind of thing that we can do to support children's communication and language. So I'm going to play a video and I'm hoping I press the right button to make sure the sounds on it. So let's give it a whirl. Joe, just tell me if we can't hear the speak. I tell you what, it's not not even let me play it. Bear with me a minute. Sorry. Usually has the uh, arrow and the play button in the middle of it. It's not allowing me to do it. Bear with me a minute. So this is from the DFE. Um, support pages that have come out recently that we've shared as link workers um, and this is what they've support produced really to support uh, preschools, nurseries, childminders uh, in actually implementing the reforms and all, all the different areas of the YFS 
um, have been included. And this one is about communication and language, obviously, uh, which meets the theme of tonight. So I'm hoping the sound is going to play. Can you hear that, Joe? Can you hear it? No. No. I don't right, know bear with I me a minute, everybody. OK. Bear with me. I didn't press the right button. I'm going to I'm going to press it now and then we'll be able to play it. OK. Let's take it back to the beginning. OK. Language development in the first years yeah. of life is critical to later educational success. Language skills are time sensitive, which means that they're really difficult to acquire later on. As practitioners, we're in a position to make a big difference at this crucial stage by providing a rich language environment and by being attentive conversation partners. Language development is best supported in a playful environment full of stories and songs, rhymes, signs, talk and imaginative play. So one of the things we're going to talk about is actually just trying to find time to talk with children in everyday experiences and routines. I'm just wondering whether you've got some examples that we could explore around that. Um, when I was working with the, in the two-year-old room, um, I think one of the things we've been really thinking about and reflecting on is, is ensuring that the routine has a pace but isn't so quick that the children are rushed through it because drawing those daily routines and those everyday activities is a really good opportunity to, for them to explore and talk and us to talk together with them and they're really able to make connections with their home routines. I think it's really important for children to have real reasons to talk and have lots of opportunities for spontaneous conversations, but also perhaps um, more structured times with adults to support their communication and language. Have you got any examples that you use in your setting? When we finish the first bit of the morning, we come back and sit down in small groups, which is we talk, we call um, review time and the children they um, talk about what they, what they have been learning in that morning and uh, they share with their uh, peers as well and um, you know they ask what they've been and what they like and what they were doing and who were they playing which is very important for children who doesn't want to talk that a lot you know and they share an experience as well. I think that really predictable routine of review time, because it happens every day, it gives confidence for those children who might not initially be able to um, be able to express themselves verbally. Um, and we use lots of visual um, prompts to support the children, photographs of what they've been doing that morning, might be real things that they bring, a model that they've made. Um, and they're the experts because they're the ones who've been doing that learning in the morning and it really supports those children who may feel a little bit more shy in a group or just not might not yet have the vocabulary or they might be learning it in a, in a new language from their home language. A really great way of introducing children to new words and vocabulary is using really great books and songs and rhymes um, do you have any experience of, of using great things in your nursery school? Um, we use songs and stories really regularly with the children as we do all the way through um, the nursery. Um, that repetition really supports the children to consolidate their learning and gives them that sense of understanding and feeling part of the group. Um, with the two-year-olds particularly, lots of the action rhymes and nursery rhymes which have actions that go with them that you can use your whole body to explore um, really support children to sort of understand the different parts of the word um, and to really tune into the sounds within the words um, as well as as that sense of joy of using your voice to express yourself and using your whole body to to express yourself the best thing of all is enjoying conversation with children and encouraging children to talk to each other. If a child knows you like talking and listening to them, they will want to talk and listen to you. Children will learn so much language in their earliest years and this unlocks new learning in all areas of their life. Exploring language with young learners is so important and as practitioners, we're in a very powerful position to make a big difference by providing a rich language environment. 
Play is often the best way for children to use and explore the words that they're learning in meaningful contexts. OK, so that was, yeah, as I said, that was taken from the new DfE resources that they've put out to support um, uh, earlier settings to um, put the reforms into place from September. And this is just another screenshot of that of the page and what to expect when you go onto that resource. Um, so there are three areas uh, that split for communication language. Uh, and obviously the one we were just looking at was about interactions. There's also about exploring language and listening and understanding as well. So do uh, yeah look at those. Some good stuff there. Okay, moving on now. So, um, what we need to think about is everyday words. We've talked a lot about extending vocabulary, and there will be words that children use every day. Words such as house, street, tree, and car. You know, all of those ones where we hear children just, just you know, verbalising just one word to begin with, not necessarily stringing words together. Uh, and those will be the familiar words that they know about. But just to make you aware that there are also a list of words, you can get these off the web, um, you know, very commonly known off, you know, many of you will already have these listed in your settings as well and you will know all about them. Um, but be aware of tier two vocabulary words as well. So these aren't the everyday ones. This is So it's important to use these type of words in context, but in our settings so that we introduce children to those words and we're building on their um, vocabulary all the time. So I just wanted to highlight that really for you. What I really love about the EYFS 2021 is it really puts an emphasis on rich first-hand experiences for children um, and you know making sure that we're putting those into place in our settings um, and one aspect of it especially in understanding the world is about visits and visitors um, and a colleague of mine Sue Rayner if you've been on the maths training you'll know Sue or if you're a teacher you'll recognize her from moderation training but uh, she was a teacher for many many years uh, in Bristol um, and her class of children um, often they lived near a you know things like the beach for example but they'd never actually been on the sand so she said that it's so important to kind of put these things into place for children and it you know some of these go from the sublime to the ridiculous really the zoo lab which some of you may have had in the past obviously that costs and that's a visit a visitor that's coming in at a cost to your setting and you might not have a budget for that but on the other hand a visit to your local park will also give really kind of rich experiences for children uh, they might not have a lot um, and actually being with their peers there listening to the language you know you helping them to use the resources um you know is, is a really positive thing the one i love most on here is the visit from a chicken uh, and when sue talks about it she said that was one of the most amazing days in all of the children in her classes lives they say uh, literally the chicken just came and hung out in the outdoor area for a day uh, and the amount of language that that prompted and the talk and the kind of problem solving and all of those things was just absolutely brilliant the church can be a really great place as well to visit. Um, Nikki, the other day in one of these training sessions, was talking about the acoustics, and I hadn't really thought about that. So children listening to their voices with different acoustics, singing in the church, you know, um, speaking to each other from across the side of the room, um, you know, could you know really kind of open their eyes to new experiences that they might not have had before. And then, of course, drawing on the people that you know. So, you know, the, the children in your um, settings, do they have parents that do different kinds of jobs? You know, invite them in to talk about what they do for a living and perhaps demonstrate some of the things. As you can see here, there was a visit from somebody from, from a lifeboat crew. And I can just imagine that being absolutely amazing. Sue's just, but they had a visit from a turkey. Is that right, Sue? Oh my God, that's amazing. So, yeah, the chicken or the turkey, I just love that. Been saved from Christmas that visited us or imagine the conversation around that and actually for um, understanding the world thinking about the past you know talking about Christmas in terms of that and the way that people have turkey if you've saved a, a turkey at Christmas that's an amazing experience uh, and then of course there's some observational drawings of um, you know at Clevedon Pier that's you know potentially for older children who'll be able to sit and do that kind of activity but you can just see uh, these examples of things that you could easily plan into your um, academic year 
and again just using the most mundane experiences or the mon most mundane everyday kind of things to to try and use it imaginatively so that you're um, influencing the children to use their imaginations as well so this uh, came from an idea that Greg Bottrell and if you've been to some of our previous training Greg's done a couple of sessions for us uh, and his imagination trees well worth a look at some lovely lovely ideas but it's about being playful being imaginative going back to our own kind of childlike behaviors uh, and you know this isn't just a tree on the left it's not just an gnarly old tree you know there might be fairies or goblins or something living in it the tree might talk that might be its mouth or that might be his eyes you know they're looking at something and opening up children's imagination to the awe and wonder of the most mundane thing around us is a, is a real gift really for, for supporting children's um, language acquisition and imaginations. And then the one on the right, I really love this, and, and Nikki's done this a couple of times. She's talked about the man and the signpost um, and obviously prompting children to think about where that man is going. Uh, I wonder who's taking with him. I wonder how long it's going to take him to get there. So you can just see these really kind of very mundane situations can open up some opportunities for us. Uh, and going back to the visits and visitors um, idea, like Joe said before, it's really important to plan for books um, so that you can make the most out of them and make sure that you're prepared for using those books and extracting the language and the vocab that will support children. And the same can be said for planning in your visits and your visitors or the experiences, the rich first hand experiences that you want your children to have. So, you know, we all know that life can get really, really busy, especially in the summer term when things kind of just concertina up and, and, and you know, gets difficult to fit things in. So planning it in advance, structuring your curriculum around these things could be one way of looking um, at supporting children's um, not only their acquisition of knowledge etc uh, but also their learning across all seven areas uh, you can see camping role play you know things as, as simple as that but being planned in you know you're going to be able to do it and do it effectively so the children can get the most from it um, and then again past and present you know Sue just used the example of the turkey at Christmas um, but talking to children about their past could be as simple as what they did last Christmas or what they did at their birthday last year. You know, things that they really will remember and want to talk about, but is encouraging them to use past tense uh, and all those things that we want them to learn to do. These are really, really great books. Just an idea, really, of starting to think about different books to have. And I know we've obviously talked at length about books already, but this is more to do with the kind of understanding the world, giving um, children new knowledge, but also giving them the opportunity to talk about their own experiences to encourage those rich first hand experiences. Um, the book on the left, which is um, The Great Big Book of Families by Ross As Ros Asquith, is really, really brilliant. So basically, it it gives examples of lots of different families, lots of different cultures, families of all shapes and sizes, um, you know, so that the children actually can think and compare and contrast with their own families. And that just opens up the opportunity to talk about those kind of things, you know, wonder about them uh, and wonder why things are different sometimes. And, and the book on the right, The Proudest Blue, is absolutely lovely. It is aimed at slightly older children, i.e. reception children, um, but actually talking to them about these uh, kinds of things is really really important it's just an example really and it's about a little girl's first day in school wearing her hijab and actually uh, there are some children who are unkind to her about that and it's her experience of that and how she has camaraderie with other children and her sisters uh, to love her hijab and the fact that she really loves the material and she talks about the color of it and things like that and it really explores those kind of cultural aspects that we want all children to know and understand and you might have some experiences or, or books that you use as well. Uh, for, for, you know, so in the new understanding the world, it talks about uh, fostering understanding of culturally, socially, technologically and ecologically diverse world. Oh, apologies. I've got a gremlin in my computer, obviously. Apologies, everyone. Go back to the right slide. That's better. Um, so if you've got any suggestions of books, please do put them in the chat because um, everybody likes to to have a recommendation of a good book that they've used with children. And if it's culturally diverse or opens up, uh, you know, kind of talking about families, then, then that would be even better still. Thank you. 
And again, the resources that we use as well, you know, the things that we have in our um, home corners, out in the mud kitchens, um, in our um, continuous provision. Uh, it's really good to understand what experiences the children are having at home and obviously try and include those in our everyday provision for them. So, you know, clearly, again, this came from Sue. The ideas came from her. So she was uh, with a class of children in Bristol. Um, so some of these things, children in Bristol, and some, you know, it might be some children more locally as well will have had experience of. Uh, so the little spice um, container at the top, it's used in Indian cooking and people, people often use that at home to have all the different spices in it. So children may have come across that. Children likely will have come across chopsticks and woks and things like that. So having access to those kind of resources every day also will spur them to think about experiences they've had at home and more likely to talk about them and share with other people in settings. Uh, and then having culturally diverse uh, dolls, for example, is really important. We've heard about that before. Different kinds of material is a really um, interesting and uh, easy thing to have in your um, environments. And it's beautiful. You know, there's a sari material here is absolutely stunning. You know, to have that actually in your setting and the textures that are with that as well would open up children to think, wow, this is different. You know, I'm going to compare it to my bed sheets at home or whatever. Colouring pencils in different shades of skin tone to be able to use is really important. Um, and although our ch children are very young in our, in, our, in our settings, you know, they can use sophisticated artist materials. So actually having really nice, delicate pencils like this, as long as we model the use of them, can be used really appropriately and actually give that aspiring artist the chance to actually get the eyelashes in place rather than using these big paintbrushes where you can't get any of that kind of detail. And I just wanted to highlight this book so much. Um, when I talked about this the other day in one of our uh, training sessions, somebody said they've used it and they absolutely love it. So it's by uh, an author called Trish Cook. It's written in a really easy singy song rhyme that's fun to say aloud. So really appropriate for earlier settings, but it captures the culture of an Afro-Caribbean family. And actually the writer uh, you know, writes the language as if, as if it would be spoken. So just a really fun uh, and brilliant way to talk about different cultures with children. OK, we've had some uh, things in the chat. Uh, we've had some books about my mum, uh, mummy, my dad, single parent families, different cultures, families. Brilliant. Yeah, Natalie, I, 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 I'm sure the children really got um, you know, a lot out of that. We've had a pig visiting regularly. Oh, brilliant. Love that. The ch children bottle fed as we were watching it grow. That's amazing. OK, we have a few um, LGBTQ plus books, but we're in the process of ordering some more and having a lending library to allow more access to books. Also, we have discussed about CD books as well. Great idea, Ryan. Yeah. And, and, and actually, we're hoping that the library service is going to start offering some lending books, uh, things like this. So culturally diverse books, um, other kinds of resources that match to the uh, requirements of the UIFS 2021. So watch this space because there will be some some offers like that coming out. Okay, so I'm going to hand back over to Jo. Sorry, I have to be honest, I did chuckle about the pig visiting. I think that's fantastic. I love it. Absolutely love it. So we're going to now think about and explore how to thread communication language and literacy into your curriculum aims. So this image here says this is our curriculum, but we know it is your curriculum and that's a, there's a huge emphasis on that. Um, the next slide here is just a quick recap and summary of the educational program for communication and language and this might be um, a, a format you like to use um, because obviously it picks out those key highlighted statements of the must that your curriculum must demonstrate and support children in. Um, now we all know that these aspects here, those interactions, conversations, your environment, everything is is demonstrated through all areas of learning. And you are, we keep saying it, you are doing it already. And none of these are sort of stand alone items. And so it's just important, though, to use the educational programmes to ensure we are. Um, you know, all of these things will happen throughout the day through all a variety of activities indoors and outdoors. And it's about ensuring that adults are providing the environment and activities 
and following the children's lead as well. And like the lady in the video said, you know, a lot of these just happen in our day to day routines. As a child arrives at nursery, we have that back and forth interaction, don't we? At snack time, we ask a question, would you like this? Or we encourage children to possibly not at the moment because snack times are slightly different, but we might encourage children to hand out the food to their to their friends. I nearly said colleagues then. Um, I suppose they are. Um, but yeah, so it's about understanding that every little opportunity, uh, even those mundane routine tasks do have those opportunities to support the educational programmes for communication and language. So we're going to look at a curriculum overview. Now, I'm going to do my very best to outline this image to you. Um, before we actually look at the links in the curriculum in, um, to communication language, we wanted to share this curriculum overview from Sheringham Nursery School, which is where Julian Grenier is the head. Um, and this links to their curriculum and assessment policy, which links to their curricular goals. And um, Nikki, who wrote this, and I agree with her, and I'm sure Alison does, said, you know, this brings everything together and a way that your routines and activities fit into your curriculum, which is ongoing, which is what we already do. You know, you can remember the, the cycle images of plan, um, not plan do review, but the observation assessment planning cycles in the, what we, oh, oh, I know we're still using it at the moment, but what we may say is the old EYFS. Those cycles are so common, such a common thread in early years. So this is an overview and encompasses everything and obviously focuses on communication and language. The blue circle, the inner circle, depicts a curriculum overview which links to everything you are aware that your educational programme slash curriculum must involve and these are the activities and experiences for children as set out under each area of learning. The green circle on the outside, as you can see, is the continuous provisions, that's your environment, your resources, you, your staff, your routines, your continuous enhanced provision, and that links into everything. It's your planning and assessment of your enabling environment, including that intent, your agreed way of working and your aims to help children learn and develop. So if we look at um, number one, the teaching and learning based on children's interests. Now, all aspects of the curriculum require practitioners to be flexible and to take account of children's interests. And these are your activities, planned and spontaneous, and include the implementation. So how are you going to do this? So how are you going to teach children and learn and extend their interests? Thinking about that. So what's your role in it? And then number two is that regular cycle of learning. And that will be your, your curriculum will be a progress model, which we have discussed in previous trainings. And we need to remember that when we are building on children's interests, we are planning to broaden or deepen those interests. So the progress model will specifically link to points two, three and four. So, for example, if we're thinking about the core books and rhymes box in box A, we would obviously begin with those very simple repetitive texts. So imagine back to the, my three little pigs example, you know, if one of your core books was that, you would start with those very basic, simple stories and then expand on that with more complicated and complex um, vocabulary in possibly a slightly longer story. And the same with rhymes and songs. And over time, children would progress onto text with more, like I said, sorry, complex vocabulary and structure. The same with forest schools. You wouldn't just take a group of children out to a forest and start lighting fires, etc. You would have to start at the very beginning with the introductions to the tools you're going to use, ground rules for safety and how to use the equipment. So it's the starting points and moving forward, that progression. And then Alison's already outlined visitors, how they can contribute to, um, you know, that that starting point to give children those experiences and those core um, events. Um, I, you know, I, I had visitors into the setting. I can remember, um, I don't know how she did it, two weeks in, um, one of the children's mums, obviously, um, that she had twins and they brought the twitch she brought the two week old twins in to the nursery and wow that was incredible that was my planning done for the next oh couple of two or three weeks it was amazing where that led to so you can see how that can 
contribute and and you can weave in what you want the children to learn through their interests another key points within this are that most learning is obviously play based indoors and outdoors crucial to include the outdoors as many children prefer that to be out there you know there is a balance in your curriculum of adult initiated experiences and that guided learning we offer them and child initiated experiences and adults take children's interests and their strengths as their starting point seeing children as a competent learner you know really acknowledging and valuing their contribution and parent involvement we've touched on this a lot is absolutely crucial and looking to the home learning environment to extend but also also to support us as well we can learn so much from them and they can contribute so make them feel included as well so moving on throughout all of our training just gonna go to that there we are um throughout all of our training we have said that you have to design your own curriculum curricular goals curriculum plan and on our website we have examples of curricular goals and plans and we have two examples here that are taken from these. Um, these are available on our website, our EYFS reforms page, if you if you would like to look at these further. And obviously we are focusing tonight on communication and language. So in the green box on the left, we have a nursery example and they have developed curriculum goals for each area of learning. And here we have the communication and language, which will be throughout every day due to the nature of interactions and support etc but you need to make sure that with these key aims on this one for example that they can be assessed so for example the statement that says um sorry i can't find it now about in um where is it develop a lifelong love of reading sorry <laughs> i couldn't see for looking you know this is a long-term goal we're not going to see those children when they're 16 when they're 25 are they still loving reading are they picking up picking up a book you know head in a novel when it's bedtime we will not know that so we cannot use that as a smart measurable goal so we need to really think about making sure that our goals that we set are measurable like i said and smart really think about that they have to be outcome led on the left on the right hand side you've got eight curricular goals and these are from julian grenier in the sheringham nursery um, and the communi communication language and literacy is woven throughout yet again but they're their first goal that they aim with they use is the settling in and becoming a confident learner so obviously the first milestone within that would be for children to grow in confidence and their involvement in nursery activities deepens. And as they progress, they will explore a wider range of activities. They will play for longer periods of time. They will play alongside their friends. They will play collaboratively and they develop their pretend play, all including interaction verbally and non-verbally. So you can see that would build up to them eventually. You could say, yes, they are now a confident learner. Obviously, that always continues in different contexts, but that you they would work through those. The curricular goal number two, follow a recipe to bake a bread roll. I'm sure many of you, if you attended one of our introductions to the EYFS reform sessions, are familiar with this. Um, and you can still um, all of the uh, what am I trying to say? All of the milestones in all of these are available on our reforms page. The link is at the bottom if you want to look into this more. But the curricular goal there is to follow a recipe to bake a bread roll. But prior to that, children need to know how to use utensils. So therefore, they're supporting fine motor control, which is practice for using writing implements, as we know. So that links into literacy. They will eventually use a recipe card that might have images on to support their um, them being able to bake the roll. So that supports to literacy. Print has a meaning and adults will use language when explaining the recipe and the method. So you've got that introduction to all that different um, vocabulary, you know, kneading the dough. You know, some children may never have heard those words before. So every area with, is within an area. And, you know, we know we know that we do these things naturally, but they need to, any goal that you have, any aim, they need to have those progression models. How are you going to get the children to that end, that sort of end destination, if you would like to call it that? 
If you look at both end, both of the last statements in both boxes, one says communicate using meaningful marks, the other one says write the first two letters of your name. Now, we know that children don't just come in and pick up a pencil and do either of those things. So again, we need you need to consider with these, if you did have these as part of your aims um, or goals, then children would need to ensure that they had strong, their strong core, you know, key gross motor movements were in place and then they would build those up and have the strength. And then eventually that would come down to their fine motor skills. Even as I'm saying it, I'm going like this with my fingers. Can't not do it. Um, <laughs> and that is the progression until you get to that end goal. And if any of you have attended the wriggling to writing training, you'll, you'll understand about how that progression is there for to support that and just to support all of what I've said there you know in that discussion I had with the early adopters setting the other the other day um they talked about how she talked to me about how um having these goals and then children working through the progression to get to those it just flowed and it became an just a very actually very easy to do because it was just children would naturally progress through it and yeah, she just kept saying those two words, it flows. And because they were with the children more modelling, supporting, um, then that it was really, really effective. And that leads nicely on to actually the definition of teaching of Ofsted. Because this example, which I hope and I'm sure many you many of you have seen, um, this is, you know, how we do it with the children. We know pedagogy plays an important part in the implementation of the curriculum. It's the how we're going to get the children to do these things. And adult support is vital again and has been covered throughout this session and in many, many others. And it is useful for leaders to ensure that all staff are aware of this definition of teaching. And through the methods of teaching, you know, communication is the key. And I'm not going to read the whole list out to you because we've talked about these already tonight and highlighted them. But are you and your team aware of these? Um, you know, I've actually heard of a setting who have printed this off and put it on the back of the toilet door. So their members of staff can sort of look at it and think, oh, yes, I do do that. I do do that. And so I am teaching the children. And sometimes it's about the adults having the confidence to realise that they actually are a teacher. And if you look in the footnote of the statutory framework, I've even written down the page number, page 11, it actually says in inverted commas, teachers should be understood to refer to any practitioner working with the child. So if you're demonstrating something, if you're encouraging, if you're tuning in, setting challenges, and accounting for the equipment, the environment, the structure and routines and have high expectations of the children. You are a teacher and you will be supporting them through your curriculum to progress. I think that's everything on my notes and I'll hand back to Alison. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, it was um, interesting what you were just saying about the progression model and the continuous provision, because I was talking to a colleague from Dorset today and she said that there'd been a couple of offset inspections recently, actually. And the offset inspector had focused with one setting on the I think it was the sand and water trays and had been questioning the practitioners about why they had the things in the in those trays that they had and then asking them, OK, so what what, what was in there two weeks ago and what's going to be in there in two weeks time? How can you prove that this is, you know, showing the progress of the children? How are you helping them make, uh, you know, follow that progression model? So they really are going to be asking about that. So, yeah, it, um, very um, good to think about it. OK, so the last section now is to consider how to assess communication, language and literacy. Again, assessment's been something that, you know, understandably people have got quite anxious about with the changes coming in in September. So this is a reminder again, um, and this has been included in some of our previous training sessions, but it is about assessment, that is. It is about checking what children have learned. It's about noticing what children can do and what they know. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to write it down. And actually, we have to take really seriously um, the research and the evidence behind the pressure on um, us as early as practitioners, you know, obviously as teachers, uh, as staff working in any kind of setting. It's just been too much and we haven't had a chance to spend enough time with the children. So noticing and using your, you know, your professional knowledge, you know that that child, as long as they're, you know, developing 
in the right way is they're accessing your curriculum. If they're accessing your curriculum, then you don't need to worry too much about it. And then occasionally you're going to do a deep dive. You're going to look at them holistically. But otherwise, they're accessing your curriculum. That is your next steps. OK, so your curriculum is your next steps. And you no longer need to put down next steps for each and every child. If you have a child with SEND or is at risk of falling behind or has an additional need, you may need to do different next steps. But for all children or for the majority of children, you won't need to do that. So it does require practitioners, teachers to understand child development. And I would really urge you if anybody's feeling, you know, a bit out of practice with it, um, give them time to go and research it obviously it's all there for you and all the documents that we shared now on our toolkit can support with that the various elements for example so if you want to look about language and communication look at the ecat tracker tool that is very clearly a child development progression model which shows you the kind of steps children take naturally from a child development point of view to to gain language um, and communication skills uh, similarly with maths as well M maths as i said before it's quite fixed in the way that it's done so look at it very holistically in terms of what the child development what normally should happen for that learning and give them a chance to go and kind of have a think about that uh, and going back to what I was saying a minute ago, you know, accurate assessment can highlight whether a child has a special educational need or might need extra help. So noticing using our professional knowledge um, considering whether the child is accessing the curriculum if they're not or you're worried about them in any way then there could be a bit of an additional assessment done on them to, to, to you know to to find out what it is that they need to support with so it is really good idea and we've been urging you to do this all the way along to think about whether your assessments or the ones you're planning to use are going to be useful and if they're not I would urge you to scrap them okay assessments should only be made where they are truly useful when it's telling you something about the child uh, and it's informative and it's helpful um, and I do want to say and it might be controversial but tapestry obviously we do use tapestry a lot I'm not saying it's not still valid it absolutely is but please please turn off the tracking element of it okay this is for you now you are the tracker and we're not tracking children but you know that they're accessing your curriculum so therefore they're on track okay so think of it and try and switch your thinking around in terms of, of that um, and yes absolutely use tapestry to support um, home uh, setting learning so that the parents are aware of what's going on and obviously capturing those lovely moments that you do on video and, and by photograph that's still really great but but from a tracking element you're the one who's deciding whether they are on track uh, and meeting your curriculum aims an assessment should not take practitioners away from the children for periods of time. And Joe said about um, the colleague of ours who has been an early adopter and how truly they have experienced the reduction in paperwork and the fact that they've spent more time with the children. So, you know, I really think that's, um, you know, an important element to take on board. And obviously there's quite a lot of work we've got to do to get ready for September. So the workload probably has got a little bit worse. If not, you know, we're not taking it away just yet. But putting those things in place will hopefully mean that when you're getting into the into your stride next year, the workload is reduced. But absolutely no setting should stop using assessment in ways which work for them. So if there's something that really, truly works and is helpful to you and tells you something really great about the children, then please do carry on using it. So helpful assessments will pinpoint how well a child is progressing towards the settings curricular goals. So we've said in our previous training, you know, once you've kind of decided together as a team and it's important that everybody's involved with that, you've got your curricular goals. Your assessment then fits in, should fit in quite naturally with it. Um, so it will guide your planning and your routines and your resources. The model that Joe showed you in terms of thinking about those everyday experiences, maybe your visits and visitors, um, forest school if you use that. That, those kind of elements of the rich first sounding experiences to, to kind of frame your curriculum and then make sure that you've got your progression around it will really help to help your assessment because as I said it will come more naturally but if they're not help, helpful if they apply fixed ability categories so those age bands for example they might limit children's future learning because what we're trying to do is help them access the curriculum we're scaffolding up not differentiating down so all children um, can get those really great experiences and, and uh, learn on them get you know um, progress uh, and improve their knowledge and understanding 
so it's about checkpoints not checklists and again that comes with your curriculum that's why you need to design your curriculum first it's about you being the expert and you all are and you know the children that you're working with use your professional judgments notice what they're doing notice what they're not doing of course and obviously act accordingly and then observing for a purpose. So again, observing doesn't necessarily need to be written down, but occasionally there'll be that real well moment that you do want to record. And it's such a lovely celebration for the parents as well. So it is important that when it's appropriate, you do do that. So it's not just about watching a child from a distance or a young child from a distance. It often requires listening to their talk, reflecting on what it means, being in the moment with them, like we were talking about earlier. So all of those things, hopefully you'll see are coming um, and, and bringing this into a nicely rounded um, conclusion. And there are supporting materials. We all know at the moment there is a concern out there that children's speech and language, uh, especially when they go up to school, you know, some children are falling behind. And as the data right at the very beginning, all those statistics tell us, you know, that can have a real detrimental effect on their outcomes. So if you are worried at all about a child, there are loads of tools and resources out there to support you. Um, every child a talker, ECATS, we talk about that a lot. It's from the National Strategies, which is years old now, but it's still really relevant and very, very helpful, useful. Uh, and again, looking at that progression model, it does split speech, language and communication down into its comp um, the component parts rather, um, so that you can actually use that as part of your curriculum. It's not about reinventing the wheel. Some of this stuff already is there for you to use and take off the shelf. Um, universally speaking, that's the ages and stages of ch children's communication development. Again, similarly, you can use that. Uh, we talked about the EEF, Education Endowment Foundation, preparing for literacy. I really do stress that's a great document. Uh, and then there's an ICANN stages of speech and language development on the right as well. So you can see there's loads of stuff out there to support you um, and, and to do kind of assessments on children just to make sure that they are on track, accessing your curriculum. Um, and if they're not for any reason, you can do something really timely to support and help them. OK, so that has uh, finished section six. That's all the sections done. So really now it's with the remaining 10 minutes, it's an opportunity opportunity rather for us to reflect on what we've heard tonight. Um, we've had some really lovely ideas coming through. They've been really brilliant. So um, what has worked well for you in your setting that has encouraged conversation and language? Although we're not in person tonight, meeting each other face to face, a lot of what is really beneficial about training, Joe and I were talking about this earlier, is, you know, talking together about our experiences and learning from others. So if you've got any really great anecdotes or things that you think will support others, please do pop them in the chat or bring yourselves off mute by putting your hand up. Um, and is there any idea or anything you might change as a result of tonight's session? You don't necessarily need to share that with us, but just have that in the back of your mind. Maybe you've got a couple of next steps or things that you want to take away from tonight to share with your colleagues back in settings um, or your communities uh, and make some changes. So anything you want to put in the chat, please do. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Jo for her contributions tonight. This was your first training session and you sounded yeah. like an absolute pro, Jo. So thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Um, and we also have an evaluation as well. So um, Gemma, I don't know whether you've popped the evaluation in already. If you haven't, would you mind popping it in? Your yeah, feedback yeah. is, thanks Gemma, thanks. The feedback is so important to us. We keep saying this, but really is true. We talk about this in our team meetings, don't we, Jo? We yeah, look at the feedback yeah, and we really do act on it. So if, if there's something that you feed back and you want something done slightly differently, we do do listen to you. So please take the time. It's only a couple of minutes to fill that form out. Um, it's in the chat now for you. Uh, and whilst you're pondering on any other questions you might have or comments, um, Nikki is brilliant at putting these really kind of positive uh, quotes or phrases in at the, at the end. But this one's lovely. I just love the little photograph of the little boy look, or the might be a little girl, sorry, uh, pointing at the lion on, on her um, romper suit. But talking to infants and toddlers, talking to anybody really about the real things they're doing is the most powerful, natural way for them to learn language. That's a quote by Janet Lansbury. Just a really nice, positive um, note to end the evening on. Um, so, yeah, thank you to everybody for your time tonight. As always, we're flabbergasted. You come and spend your evenings with us. So we're so, uh, <laughs> so grateful for that. Um, and thanks to Joe as well.
Yeah, there's quite a few of you who have asked for the um, the book corner or the book area audit. I think that's something Nikki might have to sort of sort of put into a format. So I can't say how quickly that will be available, but I will talk to her about it. Um, and it may be something that needs a few weeks development just to let you know. Um, so it may not be available immediately, but if you want the learning environment audit, that is available on our EYFS reforms page. Um, and so that's for the whole environment. Sue's just put something in the chat to say uh, the children have made my journey to nursery story with Mark making and talking it through with an adult. Next steps will be shared with peers. That's really lovely. Lovely. Really nice. Really nice. Yeah, we will. We'll be around for the next um, few minutes until half past. So so if you'd like to ask us anything, then please do feel free. Uh, but otherwise, thank you so much for attending tonight and um, have a lovely evening and a great weekend when it comes. And dare I say it, I hope the football goes our way. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying that. I'm really not into football, but it's really inspired me. <laughs> you can't. You've just got to join in, haven't you, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. That's really, really nice of you to say. Thank yeah, you. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. Oh, Kelly's coming. Only yesterday we were lucky enough to have a wedding at the church opposite our preschool. Oh. This to talk about bell ringing the sounds oh. from the church, how the clocks work. We extended this by looking at videos of bell ringers and a walk over to the church too. Lots of interesting language. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, that just sums it up. That's perfect, isn't it? That really is. Yeah. And many children won't have ever had that experience. No, no. That's amazing. I still Actually, get funny. about being one weddings. Of my daughter, one of my daughters is 20. How old is she? I was terrible. I've forgotten. She's 24. And I think she's only been to two weddings. And one of those was when she was a baby. So she can't even remember it. So, you know, interesting. Not everybody experiences these things, these sort of events. So, lovely. I recorded a version. Yeah, we're recording oh, yes. this one. Despite the uh, tech issues with the video, we uh, we will share it. <laughs> we just might have yeah. to warn people. <laughs> yeah, and that's on our EYFS reforms page as well. There's a YouTube. There's a link to our YouTube channel. We're all very we're a very techie savvy now with our YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, and all of our trainings um, linked to the reforms are also available on there. Yeah. No, I agree, Kay. Miss face to face chats yeah. and sharing. So do we. They will come back. I think we're just going to have to do a mixture of both because we've had such overwhelming positive comments about training virtually as well, just being so flexible and um, people able to um, engage with it so so easily. So we will do a mixture of both in the future, definitely. Yeah. probably stop the recording now yeah. but we'll still be on <laughs>